All right. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Let me know, please. Welcome. How's it going, everybody? It's Wednesday. It's mid. Is it Wednesday today? It's Wednesday today, midweek. Um, hope everyone's well. Um, food dweller, how are you? Delight Burberry, welcome. Gothic van life. Excellent. You guys can hear me. Cool. All right. So I wanted to just uh, jump on, just do a very brief uh, sort of live session, really, to be honest, and just have some interaction with you guys. Um, it's been interesting today. I've been flat out, not really been monitoring the AMC um, development so far, but I'm sure that there'll be some questions that you guys will have. Um, so I thought we'd just uh, do something on here. Uh, as a little bit of a side note, um, <clears throat> on Saturday, so this Saturday, which is the 12th, we are going to be doing a marathon live stream. So we're going to be starting off at 11 o'clock. We're going to be finishing off around about four, maybe half past four. So we're going to be covering um, just general money, money, money tips, uh, where you can save money, best deals on credit cards, all that kind of stuff. We've got a guest who's going to speak about that. His name is Andy Webb. Then we're going to be talking about crypto. Um, and I've got a guy who uh, trades crypto who's going to be coming on. He actually trades on eToro. Uh, him, himself. So he's going to be coming on to talk about crypto and everything that's going on in that space. Uh, then we'll be going on to Forex and we've got Jack from FX Education who's going to be talking about that. Uh, and then we move from there to property where I'm going to have uh, a lady called Stephanie Taylor. Uh, she runs a business called HMO Heaven. She wrote a, a book which is doing really, really well actually, to be honest. It's one of the uh, top property books on rent to rent. Um, it's called Rent to Rent Success. She's going to be speaking. I should be having um, Paul, uh, a guy called Paul Robertson. He is a property investor himself. He's got a massive property portfolio. He also runs a business as a uh, mortgage advisor as well and helping people actually get into the property development, pop investing in property game. Uh, and then we're going to finish with uh, investing, talking about investing. So um, I'm going to have uh, Jack's who is an investment manager, uh, coming on to talk about that. And we're going to be joined by Chris Gorn from a an investment startup as well. So it's going to be a full day on Saturday. I'm quite excited about it. It should be uh, really, really interesting, but it will be uh, an opportunity for you guys to ask questions in the crypto space, the Forex space, property, investing, uh, the whole shebang. And you know, with the guests that we're going to have on as well, they do know their stuff. So I'm sure they're going to be dropping a load of gems all the way through it as well. So I hope to see you there. If you can't, obviously, I don't expect anyone to sit there for the full five hours. Um, by no means. I know you guys have got big lives of your own. But if you do want to drop in uh, during the uh, day, by all means, feel free to do so. If you know people who will benefit from uh, attending a session like that, then please do share as well on the community tab. I posted the uh, itinerary in terms of the time slots that we're going to be working towards, um, just so that everybody's aware. But yeah, we will save that stream on the channel. So if you can't attend all of the sessions, you'll be able to look back over uh, the, the various segments on replay as well. But it's going to be a full day uh, in front of this screen uh, in this room for me here. Um, so yeah, any support will be very, very much appreciated. Right. So Let's see what we've got in the uh, in the chat. Yeah, Amit, from one live chat to another. Yes, absolutely, because we just had our um, Spotlight 15 on uh, Instagram, which is one that I do with Polina. It's all about personal development um, and just general, just like life, really, to be honest. It's pretty cool. Talk every Wednesday on that. Um, Yeah, so Amit is saying here, nothing much happening with AMC. You know what? I've not even looked at it today. I have no idea. You had a bit of a... See, I don't know whether the momentum has actually gone from it now. I mean, people are saying that the short, uh, the squeeze hasn't actually um, happened yet and that the uh, the shorts haven't been covered, but it feels as though it's lost a little bit of um, momentum. It, overall, it feels like it's in a downward trend right now. Um, but who knows? Interesting, hey? Um Let's have a look at this. One second. What was this? Uh, comrade saying here, it's all about clove. And someone saying here, they just lost about two grand on clove. Not happy about it. 
Yeah, I mean, I've not been following that uh, at all. I mean, I'll have a look at it and see if I can provide some commentary on it, but it's not I can comment on it without actually having paid attention to it. So, yeah, let's have a look. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the podcast on Monday, actually, guys, sorry, one second. I need to stand up because I've been sat down pretty much all day. And I do suffer after a while. I should have done this before we actually got started, but let's go. Um, all right. Okay, cool. So Kevin's asking here, can you ensure us we'll get a episode of the podcast uh, on Monday? Yes. You had an episode uh, yesterday or Monday. We are on Wednesday today, so two days ago. So gosh, just because I missed a, a week doesn't mean that the podcast is coming to an end. Um, it just happened that I had a lot going on that weekend. Uh, we're filming some stuff in London. So last Monday, I literally, I just missed it. I just didn't realize that two day shoot was going to take a little bit longer uh, for some of the content that I have coming on the channel over the next maybe two to three weeks. Be interesting stuff still. And um, I think on the channel overall, you will see um, the tone of the content change slightly. Um, because what I do want to do is I do want to bring to the forefront other people's experiences, voices. And I want to do something that is easily shareable as well. So it's not just me, obviously, you know, talking at you guys and and sharing things. I want it to be relatable and stuff. So the the shape of the content that you see is going to change a little bit subtly over time. But I promise it's going to be more, actually it will be more entertaining and just as educational. We're still continuing to do uh, things like live streams just like this. But yeah, the tone of it will change um, because I do want to make it a bit more interesting and stuff. I think there's only so much you can do in terms of just speaking at a camera before people get bored um, and kind of just want to turn off. So yeah. All right. So how many index funds do you recommend having in stocks and shares ISA? Um, it depends. I mean, you can have one if you are satisfied with where it's invested and the investment philosophy, I mean, if you're picking your own index funds, what are you picking? I think if you have a global fund, that is pretty much all encompassing um, because it means that you are going to capture all of the economic uh, regions across the world, hopefully. The US, obviously, UK, Europe, Asia, emerging markets. In a global fund, you'll get all of that. So technically speaking, one could suffice. But if you're the kind of person who's trying to pick an index fund with an emerging fund, index fund for US, an index fund for UK, an index fund for Europe, then I would argue whether what efficiencies you're getting by doing that um, and if you're getting any efficiencies at all. And I'll be questioning what your investment strategy is from the outset what you know, and how you um, plan on continuing to invest effectively. So it could be one, it could be six. It really depends on what you're, what you're investing for and where you are on your journey uh, overall. Uh that's who who is this? Come to can I do you want to come on the live? Is that what you're saying? Is that what you're saying? Let me know. Uh okay, here we go. Let's have a look at this. If someone is self-employed, can they class themselves as a business? Um well, it all depends on how you set up with um company's house, really, to be honest. So if you're self-employed, then you are self-employed. To be a business, you have to be a limited company. Um, and there are advantages to being a limited company. So if you're a limited company, you can pay yourself um, salary and you can pay yourself up to the £12,500 personal allowance. So you don't pay any tax on that. Uh, then you can decide to take dividends, which is what a lot of people would do who are company directors. It's what I do, take a, di take a dividend because anything up until your um, maximum 20% tax threshold, you take a dividend at 7.5%, uh, 7 which is a lot cheaper than 20%. So there are clear benefits to being a limited company versus self-employed, but an accountant will argue and, and say, well, it depends on what income you're making. Um, but personally, I mean, if you're, 
I find it better personally in my instance being a company, a limited company, because I can at least control what income I take, when I take it and how I take it and manage the tax position accordingly. So it really depends on where you are and what your circumstances are, Delight. But for me, uh, I'm better off as a, as a business, as a limited company than a, than a self-employed sole trader. Uh, what are your thoughts on pyramid schemes? If you know that you're going into a pyramid scheme, don't go into it. It's pretty much as simple as that, really, to be honest. Um, if you're going into a pyramid scheme, you're likely going to get hurt. So, you know, if you're happy with losing money or you're happy with whatever risk you're taking, knowing that it's in a pyramid scheme going in, then by all means, just be careful because uh, you need to be. But if you know it's a pyramid scheme, I would strongly question why you're going into it in the first place. Just don't. And don't recommend anybody to go into that pyramid scheme with you if you know for a fact that it is a pyramid scheme. Um, because then you're causing other people to lose money as well. BMO investments. BMO investments. What, what do you mean BMO? What is that an acronym for, mate? Let me know. I'm new to investing. Where to invest and cash out when retired? What? Where to invest and cash out when retired? What do you mean exactly, mate? That's not a full sentence. Can you give me a full sentence, please, mate? Just so I can kind of make sense of what you're asking. I'm just trying to see if you've put uh, a previous comment in there. If that's a part two, but I can't see any previous comment to tie that to so can you just give me a little can you give me a full sentence so i can make sense of what you're asking please bud what industries do you think will boom 10 to 20 years from now um, i think there's a few tech obviously renewable energies i think the area of ge genomics will boom in the next 20 20 10 to 20 years because it's uh advancement of technology and science. So I think those will do really, really well. Um, tech, definitely. Um, and renewable energies, there'll be a huge thing in there. Um, there is the whole argument of, you know, space ex exploration and stuff, but that could almost in some quarters be seen as a, a luxury sector to invest in when you really think about it, really. Um, but yeah, those are a couple that I think. People does a bit, appear to be investing in FUD and narratives rather than strong fundamentals. Is this a sign of a bubble, Pete? Yes, it is. Um, I mean, if you just look at what's going on with AMC and GME right now, it's one of those situations where we are all caught, no, people are caught up in this hype of, look, I can make a lot of money very quickly. And they're taking the evidence of other people making a lot of money and thinking, well, I'm, I'll be missing out here. So therefore they want to get involved. And, you know, there are no fundamental analysis. There are no, it, th th these decisions to invest in these things are not made with any fundamental analysis whatsoever. It's all driven by human emotion and human behavior, greed. Um, and I think that has a lot to say for where we are um, based on where we've come from over the last 12 months. People are, people want to make money. People need to make their money go further. So rationale sometimes goes out the window. That's just the way things are, unfortunately. Um, is it a sign of a bubble? Yes, to a certain degree, yes. I mean, we've been in a bubble for a very, very long time now. Uh, when will it pop? Who knows? I think we may be facing a circumstance which will be the perfect storm ultimately for the bubble to, to burst. But then again, I could be wrong because we've been saying that we've been in a bubble now for at least four years and it hasn't popped yet. It hasn't corrected yet. So, and as we as we keep noticing, Sometimes when you look at some of these companies that have done very, very well, fundamentals don't make any sense. It feels as though because of the power of the retail investor, some of those fundamental uh, indicators that we would normally use when value in businesses all go out the window. It's a, it's a interesting time that we're in. All right, this is a good one. Amir, okay, could you help me understand how I can incorporate investments in my stocks and shares ISA, which is with my money box? I have ETS with Vanguard. Can any can my income from these be covered 
in my ISA allowance. Okay, so you need to, so with Moneybox, Moneybox invests money for you, basically. So your stocks and your stocks and shares ISA with money boxes and investments. So you've already got investments rolled into that. You cannot take your Vanguard ETFs and put them in money box. You're not allowed to. You can't do that. You can't take your money box into Vanguard either. So what you're doing is you're you're selecting providers that do this work for you. Um, and unfortunately for you, because you have your stocks and shares ISA with Van- with Moneybox, you can't go and have a stocks and shares ISA with Vanguard as well, because that will be breaching the ISA rules. So I'm not really sure what your investment objective is, what your goal is um, in investing, but just rest assured, you know, you know, you do have investment in Moneybox. It's invested according to the way they've packaged the investment for you, based on your risk profile. Um, but there's no way you can get your Vanguard ETFs into your money box. You can't do that. It's impossible. All right. So there's just a, a, a conversation there for, uh, with Delight and Ollie's. Let's have a look and see what we've got. What's going on with this, all this <laughs> the pyramid scheme uh, trend conversation? A want to invest or put money in pyramid schemes? Legit question. Why are you asking about pyramid schemes, Ali? Let me know in the comments below. Like, are you are you? What pyramid scheme are you referring to? Do you? Uh, so here's a question for you, and put it in the comments. Are you afraid that something you've been offered is a pyramid scheme, or are you in something that you found out is a pyramid scheme? Is that why you're asking if anyone has invested or put money into a pyramid scheme? Give me a little bit of context here. And hopefully I'll be able to give you some thoughts and stuff. Is this AMD? AMD. Right, Amit? Is that AMD? Let's have a look at this one for to here. With the lifetime ISA, is it possible to rent out rooms individually within um, with the within the purchased property rather than renting out the whole property? That's as uh, that's not allowed. No. So if you're using a lifetime ISA, you cannot rent out anything according to the mortgage deeds, you uh, mortgage agreement. You cannot rent out a room in your house if you use the lifetime ISA to purchase a property, because that will meet, turn it into an investment property regardless of whether you're living in it. So you're not allowed to technically. Um, I think. No, I shouldn't really say this really, to be honest, but is your mortgage lender going to uh, find out that you're renting a room? Probably not. Um, but that is the risk that you take. If they did, you'll be in breach of your mortgage contract and that could lead to uh, penalties and all kinds of stuff. So just be careful. But the, t- the straight and the straight answer to that is no, you're not allowed to. I'm mean, saying that, that um, healthcare is a is a is a hot sector in um, in the US right now. Yes, um, and that's where genomics and, and things like that really because some of these sectors they overlap, right? Genomics is in tech, is also in healthcare, but genomics is going to be a big, big, big sector with some of the research they're doing. Someone's saying that uh, appearance scheme is a type of scam. Who would even ask that? It's true. Like, Elite, please give me some context, mate. And thank you, Gothic Van Life, for that super chat. Really do appreciate it. Thank you very, very much. Good conversation there about limited companies and self-employed um, between Ollie and, and some of the other guys there. So good conversation, guys. Great. Awesome. Right. I love this question. Simon does invest in. Can you talk about what um, an annuity is? Okay. So an annuity is essentially an investment vehicle that is used to derive an income in retirement. So 
annuities aren't as popular as they used to be anymore. But the basic premise of an annuity is like for so for example, if you if you worked 20 odd years and you wanted to retire and you say had a hundred K cash, right? And you wanted to retire what you would do is you would give your money to an, uh, to an annuity provider. And what they would say is, we will give you for £100,000, £8,000 per year in income until you die, right? So the annuity rate is dependent on a number of factors, um, bond yields, all that kind of stuff. Um, there are a lot of things that go into the actual annuity rate that you get. Um, typically, back in the day, you could probably get 5 to 7% roughly. Um, in recent years, certainly in the run-up to 2014, they were very, very poor. And they've been poor since then because things like you know, uh, your, your traditional rates, inflation and bank rates and all that kind of stuff do impact on annuities. But annuities is essentially where you give a lump sum of cash in exchange for a lifetime income, and they will pay that amount of money for as long as you live. So for example, if you retire at age, say 60, for example, and they said, we're going to give you seven grand a year, and you live for 30 years, then you've got all of your money back pretty much um, within that period of time, because you would you would have taken two hundred and ten thousand pounds. Whereas if you used, you know, seven thousand pounds from your hundred thousand pounds in the bank account, you'd run out after a relatively short period of time. So those are annuities. They are not very popular anymore um, because they, I wouldn't say they were outlawed, but the, the a piece of legislation called Pension Freedoms was um, passed back in two thousand fourteen, I think. 2014, 2015, which meant that people didn't have to purchase annuity because that's what everybody kind of did before. Now you no longer have to. So yeah, annuities were great. They were good value for money back in the day. Not so much now because the interest rates that they offer or the income that they offer in exchange for your capital is not great. And another thing that was really bad about annuities was if you had quite a significant amount of money. So imagine you had 500 grand you're giving away 500 grand in cash. So if you died after two years and you only had, say, on a 500 grand, for example, maybe 21,000 pounds a year, well, you've only taken 21,000 pounds out in that first year. The remainder of the money stays with the annuity provider. You don't get anything back. Nobody gets anything back. So you, you exchange a guaranteed income for the possibility that you're going to use it for an extended period of time. But if you didn't, you died before you used up all your capital, the annuity company gets to keep whatever you didn't you didn't take. So they were good, but they also had their disadvantages. A popular UK-based YouTuber likes to say, you can't build wealth plus, slash get rich by solely investing in the stock market. Do you agree with this? Um, no, I don't, actually. I think there's lots of evidence of people getting rich solely investing in the stock market. Um, but then again, you know, YouTubers say a lot of stuff. Um, what else does he advocate? Property. Property is obviously a very, very good option, an investment vehicle that people can also invest in that can make you very, very wealthy as well. But that is a very false and misleading comment to say, because there are plenty of people that get very, very rich and very, very wealthy solely investing in the stock market. The stock market is the primary engine for wealth creation, that and property and business. I mean, those are the three main things. Well, four. If you're wealthy, you've either inherited the money You've either got a business that has generated the wealth for you, you've either invested in the stock market, or you've invested in property. Really, those are the four traditional ways. And each of them can can happily make you wealthy in their own right. So that's a full, false comment for me. Um, yeah. An annuity is not growth on interest, um, elite. Uh, an annuity is a is a is a pensions uh, vehicle. It's a retirement vehicle. Uh, I'm going to answer this one. Any more updates on news on cash effects? No, not really. Um, I guess they're just doing what they do, um, and I'm I'm busy doing other stuff, mate. At the end of the day, I mean, look, as as when and things kind of like pop on my radar, or someone messages me about something and says, "Oh, look at this." If I feel that it's that it's worthy of um, 
doing a, a brief video for just to update people, then I will, but I'm not actively looking at looking for catch FX news. If I'm completely honest, there's a lots of other stuff going on uh, with the channel and things that I've got planned. And to be honest, talking about cash FX is, it kills my vibe really, to be honest. It's, it's a proper, proper drain on, on energy, uh, looking at that, that mess. So it's not something I really enjoy doing, but at the same time, I just do want people, I want people to be safe and just know that, you know, just do your research, really, please do your research. I have had a conversation with, um, a number of people from cash effects, um, in the last week or one in particular, um, and she wanted an opportunity to kind of put her, her, her side of the story aside and say, look, this is what we're doing. I told her, look, at the end of the day, you may think that it's right, but it isn't. And I gave her reasons why um, they need regulation, reasons why um, some of the why some of the stuff they're doing, I think is completely dodgy and they need to address. We had a, a mutual conversation that we, you know, agree to disagree on the outcome respectfully. And I think that is absolutely fine. Um, I've also asked her, you know, if she wants to come on to, to a live session and have a conversation and put her side generally to the public, then she's also welcome to do that. That is an open door to her. And to be honest, she was a really, really nice person to speak to, um, if I'm completely honest. And um, I think whilst there's a lot of negative uh, kind of press around them, I think as a business, they've got a lot to answer for and a lot to try and um, put right for their people or and people who use them. I think that there are still good people within that organization. And it's a shame really, because at the end of the day, it's just an organization that is not well organized. You've got fractions in there doing all kinds of just nonsense and shenanigans. And you've got some people trying to do the right thing, but just don't have any governance. They don't have proper clear leadership to, to steer them as a business. And they're just it's unfortunate really, but you know, she's welcome to come on the, on the channel. It's interesting as well. Over the last week, I had uh, another guy, a guy called Curtis uh, Ingram. He goes by, what does he go by? The vegan warrior or something like that. I mean, the exchange that I had with him on a, on e on email as he wanted to come on the channel was just absolutely ridiculous. And to be honest, if I want to make them look really, really bad, he's the kind of person that I would invite on because he doesn't, he would not have the ability to have a civil conversation. And even though I tried to get him to agree to this numerous times on emails, just saying, look, you can come on my channel. It's my platform. You have a, a, a normal conversation, like two people, we can agree to disagree. We go both on our own ways. No swearing, no calling each other names, no none of this disrespectful stuff. He wouldn't agree to it. Trying to make demands to come on my platform, like <laughs> that kind of stuff, doesn't fly for me. But <sighs> cash effects is what it is at the end of the day. So I don't have any other updates unless someone puts something on my radar that I think is um, worthwhile highlighting. Um, so yeah. I will say in this and as well, actually, whilst I'm on that topic, actually, because um, I have all the way through the the videos that I've done with Cash FX spoken with EverFX, uh, and in particular, um, the guy that they had on their kind of like social media YouTube, who was supposed to be their representative um, in Cash FX, and his name is Pablo Milan, by the way, and uh, he reached out to me last week. Um, and I do have to say this actually, um, for the record, he has been getting a load of abuse on Instagram, on his personal, um, social media feeds. And I don't necessarily think it's purely because of this channel and my videos, because I've never asked anybody to be disrespectful, disrespectful to anybody in any of those camps. I think ultimately, and I've said it on the last live about catch effects exclusively, and I'll say it here again, at the end of the day, you have to treat people with respect. You have to talk to people with respect. It's okay if you disagree, but ultimately you have to treat people with, with respect and agree to disagree and be able to do that amicably as adults. That doesn't cost anything at all. The minute we start descending into insults, threats, and, and all this kind of stuff, that's when it becomes completely and utterly unacceptable. And unfortunately, he has had a lot of abuse. And I know it hasn't come solely from this. I hope it hasn't come at all from this channel, but he has received abuse. And he 
he asked me, look, can you step in? Because apparently it's really, really affecting him. So if you are watching this and you have kind of, you know, you don't like cash effects, you don't agree with what they're doing, please don't take it out on people who are associated with them. I mean, at the end of the day, he's just the guy who works for a broker that they said was their, their leading broker that they had an exclusive partnership with. I've said it on a number of videos that that is questionable. They deny it themselves, but it is what it is. I think ultimately he's just a guy who was trying to do a job, trying to satisfy a client. And it, it sounds like to me as though they took him and that company for a ride. That's not really his fault. So I will just say it here for the record, like, just be respectful. Don't give people any grief or abuse. It's just, it's not warranted. It's, it's uncalled for and just be kind to people at the end of the day. That's all I'm going to say. Elite, mate, I have no idea what you're talking about. You really need to give me some context. Are there in a long comment so I can make sense of what you're trying to get at? Because um, I know you're talking about pyramid schemes. You, you, oh, there's comments on here, cash FX. What exactly are you trying to say? Because um, it's hard to, I don't know what you're, what you're trying to put across in the comments with it being so broken uh, in, in, in comments across this feed. So let us know. You often buy an annuity from your pension to secure a regular income stream in retirement till death or for a set period. That is right. Um, like I said, I mean, people still do use them now, but they're not very popular. Um, one thing that annuities will help you do is help you get rid of investment risk, because if you are invested in the market, you have that natural risk of your pension going up, your pension going down. Now, if you're taking an income from your pension, it's great when the the stock market is up because it means that you can cover how much you withdraw from your pension as an income and possibly make some profit. But it's not great when the markets are down or the markets are crashing. So if you're taking 5% and the market is done a minus 10 or a minus eight, for example, then it means that you are effectively taking out more money because you're, you're cashing in more units for that same level of income. So you get the opposite of pound cost averaging. It's called, called pound cost ravaging. So an annuity and a pension, a guaranteed income for life can help you mitigate that investment risk. But like I said, if you die two years, three years into buying an annuity, you've exchanged £200,000 in cash for income for life. Well, all of the profit is kept by the annuity company. And that is one of the big disadvantages of an annuity that most people don't like. But on the other hand, some people love the fact that, you know what, I don't have to worry about the income. I know that it's going to be coming in every single year. So there's a place for it, but it does have its pros and cons. Guys, there are 65 of us on here. There's only 12 likes. Help me out here. Let's get up to 30, please. That's one way that uh, people will know that this live stream was actually useful and helpful. So please, let's uh, get that like button going. Let's not forget, please. Just a general reminder. Right, let's have a look. I'm just reading through a conversation that's going on here. Bear me one second, guys. conversations about the undertaker going on in here <laughs> good man um uh Faisal, what's going on what do you mean by this i've seen this comment a couple of times let me know what what do you mean by that, mate? Um, let me know. All 
All right, so let me just uh, take care of that real quickly. All right, here's a question here that's worthwhile having a look at. Do you think as a new investor, should I invest the majority of my income in a Vanguard index fund right now, even though a major market correction may occur in the near future? Um, well, I can't give you a yes or no to that because it's up to you. It's your decision at the end of the day. But let's just say the market doesn't cra crash or correct for another five years. You haven't invested. What do you do then? You've missed out. So I think ultimately, as a newbie investor, as long as you're comfortable with the notion that your investment could go up and it could go down, and actually, let me just rephrase that, it will go up and it will go down. If you're happy with that, then by all means invest. But you have you can't invest money expecting the upside without the downside. You just can't. Nobody has a crystal ball to know when the market's going to co correct. But you know, honestly, you could you could wait for a market correction and it may not happen for another three, four years. And you've missed out on whatever growth that, we, that we've achieved over that period of time. So look, you've got to be in it to win it. You've got to be on the field of play in order to win the game. So don't just stand on the sidelines, get involved and understand what level of risk you're willing to take. That's really the most important thing as a newbie. In your opinion, what's the healthy ratio between long-term investments and short-term trades in a rookie portfolio? Uh, again, that's that's going to be down to you, mate. Um, if you're in your 20s, I mean, people will take different views to this, right? Some people will say, well, actually, short-term trades will can, you know, if you do really, really well, you can make a lot of money on short-term trades, assuming you know exactly what it is that you're doing. And I know many people who actually trade short-term who are doing very, very well indeed. And then they later on go and add um, into a long-term investment uh, portfolio. But ultimately, it's the short-term trading that gets them the capital there in the first place. So I get that. It really depends on what your goals are, mate. And you know, I know it sounds really um, flippant for me to ask that, Conrad, but it really, really does. What are your goals? You know, long-term investments is where you're going to generate the majority of your wealth because you're going to leverage uh, the power of compound interest, right? Compound interest works best over the long term, not over the short term. So you can get, you know, short-term gains, that's fine, that can give you capital. But if you really want to create wealth, you need that long-term investment strategy because of the compound interest effect. So if you're thinking long-term, then you should be thinking about long-term investments. If you're only thinking very, very short-term immediate, then short-term trading can help you because it will give you the capital for whatever purposes that you need it for right now. It's really all about what your goals are, really, to be honest. And thank you very, very much for that super chat, Zulf uh, Photography. Let me just get to your comment here quickly. One second. No, 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 no. Where are you? Came over your channel a few days ago. You're doing a great job with your content, mate. Thank you so much. And, and you know, everyone who watches the channel, I really do appreciate it and stuff. It does obviously take a lot of time and a lot of energy um, to put out content the way I do. Um, but as long as it's helping people, that is the most important thing. And I do appreciate you for supporting as well. You may think it's only five pounds, but trust me, it really does help because um, you'll see some of the content that we're coming out in the, in the next two to three weeks that's got to cost a lot of money to, 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 to produce. And, um, the plans that I've got moving forward for content, um, will require a heavy investment in terms of cash. So things like super chats will help me be able to produce more content like I have in mind. That isn't just going to be me in this room where I'm, where I'm going to have to implore, you know, videographers and an editing team and all of that kind of stuff to bring it to life properly. So five quid is a big no date donation. I do appreciate it. Thank you very, very much. All right, let's see where we were. Right. Apologies guys. I just need to find where I am on here. Um, where was I? There's a good pension uh, question in here, which I will come back to. Uh, Simon's asking there. We haven't got here yet. 
bit more stuck in. Okay, here we go. Okay, so there's a lot of uh, stuff about um, Ponzi schemes. <laughs> like, guys, seriously? If you know it's a Ponzi scheme, why on earth would you go and put money with it? I don't understand. I really don't understand. All right, follow-up question here from Delight. Um, but don't people buy a house and rent out individual rooms? Yes, you can. Uh, you would do that under a HMO and a buy-to-let mortgage, though, not using your lifetime ISA. Again, it's because of the kind of mortgage and the purpose of, of the property. There are legal ram ramifications if you're buying a house under a residential mortgage and you're renting out individual rooms. For example, if you have a fire and the house burns down, then legally you don't have the right kind of mortgage, which means that the mortgage company or the mortgage lender who lent you the mortgage doesn't have to basically pay out or any insurance doesn't have to be paid out. And the mortgage company could say, you know what, you owe us money for this house, even though it's burnt down. So, you know, there are lots of legal ramifications. So if you are going to be buying a property with the view that you want to rent out rooms, you need to make sure you're doing it under the right legal parameters just to protect yourself and not try and cut corners. These are very, very big decisions with big ramifications if you get it wrong. Uh, what's it? Rocket Investments. Rocket Investments? What do you mean exactly, Kev? What do you mean by Rocket exa Investments exactly? If that's a company, what's the ticker? If it's a company, if it's a company specifically, then I haven't looked, I don't know every single company and have a view on every single company available as an investment. So I'd need to have a look into that. But if that is a term for a category of companies that you can invest in, let me know. Context is important. Okay, here we go. This is a good question here. Uh, have money to inv invest long term, not sure where to start. Any archives you can point to? All right, okay. So, um, first question to you how long is long term? Because that means different things to different people. So, some people will say 10 years is long term. To other people, it'll be 20, 25 years. Um, if you are just starting out, or if you're maybe experienced, you will take two different approaches. But if you want to manage this yourself, really, Index funds of some kind can help you. It will give you diversification, help you manage your risk, give you global exposure. Index funds will be a good place to go um, because the research will be done for you with the likes of Vanguard or, or Eureka, for example, or um, who else is good? Fidelity, maybe, BlackRock, iShares, maybe. That will really help you. That will get you started. It will give you a vehicle to, to catapult you to on the road already. Um, but it's really important. Number one, what are you investing for? What is your goal? Are you investing for retirement? Are you investing for university fees? What exactly are you investing for? How long are you going to be investing for? Because how long you invest for will determine how much risk you take. And then from there, you can start to have a look at, right, where should I invest? Who should I use? What should the money go into? I know it sounds very, very basic, but those fundamental questions are very, very important to know the answer to, to start off with. That's the kind of stuff I go through people with, um, go through with people on one-on-one -on -one coaching, where we go through all of that, go through a risk, a risk, risk profile, risk questionnaire, understand what it is you're investing for, how long you've got to invest for. And then we start to whittle down providers and options for you to invest in so that you don't have to second guess the decisions that you're making. But there are lots of free videos on here. You can watch the Investing for Beginners playlist. There's quite a few videos in there that will give you um, the starting block. I think there's a video in there called How Investing Works. Um, watch that. If you need help one-on-one, -on -one, then just feel free to, to reach out to me. Um, there's an email in the comments and description of this uh, video. But yeah, you can start with some of the free content first.
Let's get to Simon's question. Okay, what do you think is the best way for savings for pensions nowadays as, as I recently made changes to my workplace pension? Um, as I recently made changes to my workplace pension. So do you already have, so I know that you're right, it sounds like you've already got stuff in your workplace pension. Do you have any prior or previous pensions that go along with that? Let me know. Um, but really, workplace pensions are a great place to start because, you know, there are weak, there will be cost caps on the workplace pension. Um, with a workplace pension, and again, I don't know your status, mate. I don't know whether you're employed or self-employed or whether you run your own business or not. But if you've got an employer paying money in for you, workplace pension is the best place because you're going to get free money and free tax relief from the government and your employer contributions as well. So if you've got a workplace scheme, pay into a workplace scheme and opposed to going for a private pension and make sure that if they've got a matching um, a matching opportunity, so where you might pay in 8% and the employee will match you at 8%, make sure you take advantage of that. It's not a definitive answer because there's so many other things that I would need to know to be able to tell you, right, this will be the best way for you. And that would be advice and I can't really do that, but I can definitely nudge you in what would be the best way. But it's, you know, if you're in a workplace pension scheme, and you're continuing to pay into it and you're employed, then workplace pension scheme. Just make sure that you're in the right fund though, because a lot of workplace pension schemes will basically um, put you into a default fund and you don't want to be in a default fund for an extended period of time, especially if you're young. You want to be in something a little bit more adventurous. All right. Anna, 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 Anna. I've got to give you a shout out. Thank you for that super chat, Anna. I really do appreciate it. Um, See, you are you always on Instagram, always on the live on the live uh, streams, and when we do them, I do appreciate you. Thank you so so much. You're always supporting as well. Um, let me just see if I can find your comment one second because I know you've written something on here. Uh, let's go down. Let's go down. Let's go down. They put me on money and skins because they hope to be lucky hope to be the lucky ones that will escape. They forget it can disappear at any point. Looking forward to marathon. Yeah, look, on Sunday, on Saturday, sorry. Um, yeah, the five-hour stream is going to be awesome. Um, <laughs> I need to build in some breaks um, because, yeah, it's going to be a full, a full day, but I'm looking forward to it. And thanks again, Anna. Thank you very, very much. Just trying to find where I was, guys. One second. Thank you for that. Thank you for smashing that like button. If you haven't done that already, please make sure that you do. 67 of us on here at the moment, 36 likes. So please make sure you smash that like button. It really does help for the YouTube algorithm. Thank you very, very much. All right, I'm just trying to find where I was. Bear me one second. Um... I will, uh, let me just comment on this one quickly. You know, set up a SIP, at least get the tax relief on any contributions you make. Um, look, a SIP is a self-invested personal pension. Be careful with SIPs because if you're not using the full functionalities of a SIP, you could be paying fee, you could be paying for something that you don't necessarily need. Um, and SIPs sometimes can be very, very expensive. So again, if you are in a workplace scheme, you are better off putting money into the workplace scheme than paying money into a SIP because SIPs can be very, very expensive. SIPs are especially great if you are your own boss, you have a limited company, you want to put things like commercial properties in there. That's the reason why people talk about SIPs, 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 because you can have assets within inside a pension wrapper that you can't do in normal pension 
accounts. So a SIP gives you flexibility, but you have to be in a position where you are going to be using the benefits of a SIP. So if you're employed, really, there's no reason for you to have a SIP, really. You can have a personal pension, but a SIP, I would question, because you're going to pay extra fees for it, and you may not use all the functionalities uh, that come with the SIP. So just be just be mindful of that, because that's a really, really important thing to, to know. I'm genuinely lost on here. Um, so I'm literally just going to go straight back to some of the questions that I know that I haven't already answered. Um, good conversation going here about eToro and trading 212. Um, look, the, the platform, these trading platforms are huge vehicles a lot of uh, and have a lot of influence really on what they are and i think the key to picking uh, a vehicle that best suits you is just being comfortable with um the interface and how it works you know people have like different things like someone saying in here that etoro is rubbish i quite like etoro other people will like etoro it's all about the interface and how you personally will get on with it Ostrix, thank you so much for that super chat as well, mate. Thank you. Again, it's five pounds and it's five pounds that goes a long way. It will actually help support the channel as well. So thank you very much. You haven't tagged a comment uh, to that. Um, so I, I can't pull up your comment specifically, but thank you. And thank you again to Money, Whiskey and Coffee as well. Again, you're actually here on all of the all of the lives on here. And you're also on the YouTube, um, on the IG account as well uh, with questions. So thank you so, so much, guys. I really do appreciate it. <laughs> Talking about cash effect is soul de destroying. Yes, it is, mate. It really, really is. It's an absolute nightmare. And uh, yeah, I'd rather not do it, but only when it's necessary, I guess. Uh, Elite saying he's studying accounting and finance at the moment, just learning as, as he goes along. That's good. Education is everything, mate. You're not going to get everything right all in one go. Sometimes you are going to make mistakes and that's okay. As long as you're taking a calculated risk and you're kind of learning from those mistakes, that's the most important thing in this whole equation. Uh, there's a comment here, Sip. Uh, so sip, but the only advantage that you have is you can take your money at 55 and now it's 57 because that's been extended. So, but that's the same with, um, all pension wrappers. The, the, the age to access a pension is now 57 across whether you have a sip or a personal pension or a workplace pension, the age is now 57. Oh, Kevin, mate, you kill me sometimes. <laughs> this, is freaking, this is hilarious. Vegan warriors do my freaking head in. Oh, my God. Uh, it just happens that there is actually a vegan warrior. His, his actual account is called Vegan Warrior. And, uh, yeah, he's very, very boisterous. Let's put it that way. Ask tricks. Okay, Pete, I'm a 55-year-old guy man, that has just started investing in individual stocks for the next 10 to 15 years, hopefully. I want to invest each month into the S&P 500 and the FTSE 250 as well, but they are, but are they the best for my age? Really, really good question. Okay, so if you're looking at the next 10 to 15 years, you're probably looking at something that's going to take you up to retirement, essentially, okay? So at the minute, look, let's have a look at the S&P 500. The S&P 500 will give you access to the largest companies in the US, um, which will be some of the big, big companies. Some of them will be paying dividends. Some of them won't be, but there is a very, very strong index with very, very good track record. Now, obviously, historic performance is no indication to future performance, but it's a good benchmark with good historic performance on there. The FTSE 250 will encapsulate large cap blue chip and some of the mid cap companies here in the UK. Many people will argue that mid cap is really where the growth is at. That's what a lot of people will argue. And to be honest, to a certain extent, that is very, very true. What I would say is the downside to this approach is you've only encapsulated two markets here, S&P 500, which is the United States, FTSE 250, which is the UK. Where about everywhere else? So Europe, 
emerging markets, uh, Pacific, Asia Pacific, you've got no exposure there. So essentially, you're putting all of your eggs into two geographical regions. What happens if the US crashes and the UK crashes? You've got no counterbalance. So whilst this isn't advice, and please don't take it as advice, maybe consider trying to have a look at getting some global exposure. Because what we tend to see is if if the United States goes down, another area of the world will go up. And what you want is that counterbalance. You want that uh, counter lever to help you as much as possible. So that would be something that's worthwhile considering maybe to, to research um, in your decision making. Try and see what you can get from a global point of view. If you're using Vanguard, and it sounds like you may be, um, with some of the selection, they've got global ETFs, they've got global index funds in there as well. Uh, some of them that will actually include the S&P 500. You won't get anything that includes the, the FTSE 250 exclusively, but you will get some that will have some UK exposure. So yeah, maybe have a look at some global exposure just to give you some more diversification, if you will. Elite Fitness, thank you for that super chat. Really do appreciate it, mate. Thank you very, very much. Andy, how are you? Well, let me just uh, highlight this. Andy, I have not forgotten about you. I need to do you an email. Also need to try and create you an account on the new website. It's not quite finished yet, which is why I've not done it already. So we built the uh, the site, which houses the investment course now, which you've already taken. Um, but we're trying to build a community section in there as well. So people can actually ask questions directly on the site. Um, it will just give a bit more um engagement and conversation and I'll be in that once a week. So I haven't done that just yet because there's still a little bit of work to be done, but I have not forgotten you, mate. Trust. Uh, this is a good one. What's my thoughts on Wirecard? I haven't been following Wirecard, so I can't give you a thought on those. There's so many of you that ask these um, questions about particular stocks. Let me just, one second. Wait, that's not working. Uh, I'm just going to write down some of these. So Wirecard is one that you guys have asked. If there's any other stocks that you guys want me to have a look at, put them in the comments here. And what we'll do is next time we do a, a live session, what I might do is just do a live session and just show you how I might actually go about researching a stock specifically. This is typically something that I reserve for the members group, but if it will be useful in um, in a Q&A like this, just to show you some preliminary basic stuff, I can do that. So I've just written Wirecard down here, and maybe I can include that in the next uh, Q&A that we do. Do, 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 do. This is a good question from Does. Um, yes and no. I mean, most of the companies that offered annuities were massive, massive companies. They have so much money behind them that, you know, the chances of these companies disappearing were very, very slim. But to a certain extent, yes. If the company went bust, you would have to be asking where the, would the income actually come from? Because it's not technically invested in the stock market with any returns or anything like that. So, yeah, kind of. Dude, I am so happy that you're here as well. Thank you so much for, for tuning in. Um, if you're about on Saturday, it'd be great to see you on Saturday as well because we're going to be covering so many topics and I'm sure it's going to be a good conversation as well. So thanks for being here on this uh, Wednesday evening. Andy, listen, mate, thank you so much. And this is the kind of stuff that I'm talking about. Like, this is where YouTube is awesome. The fact that, you know, I make videos from this little room here in, in the, in the house, which is now my office. And, you know, people actually have an active interest in what we do and what we say and what we're trying to do here. You know, this channel is all about education. I'm not here to sugarcoat anybody. I'm not here to sell high hopes and dreams to anybody. I will literally tell you what I think, whether you like to hear it or not, I'll give my honest opinion. Um, and yeah, it does make me the party people sometimes <laughs> because people want to, you know, be told positive things. That's just how we are as human beings, you know, but that's, I don't see my job as such. I see my job as giving you the ability to 
be able to see both sides of the coin and not play any of these shadow games where you only see the good stuff. You only see you know, the success that people have. And, you know, yeah, we made a lot of money in this trade today or in this stock today. No, it's not about that. It's about seeing both sides of the coin. That's when you get to essentially understand the the, the gravity of the decisions that you make. How it could go well, it could go bad. But if you go into something thinking it's all going to go well, it's all going to be honky-dory, and it's not, it's going to be a massive shock. And a lot of the time, unfortunately, a lot of people then get put off investing. And that's a damn shame because investing is where you really create wealth long-term. But if someone says to you, listen, if you do this today and in 20, 25 years time, you're going to have half a million quid just by doing something really, really small, a small habit that you need to develop and instill right now. Most people would be like, yeah, I'll take that. In 20 years time, absolutely. I'll still do what I'm doing, but in 20 years time, I'm going to have half a million quid or 750,000 pounds. Yeah, sign me up. People are happy to hear that if they know that it's going to take that long. But unfortunately, a lot of people are talking about, yeah, you can make 100 grand, you know, three months, two months with double, triple X and whatever your money. It's just a fallacy. It really, really is. And I don't see myself as part of that crowd. And I'm, I, may, I may not grow as a result of it or grow as quickly as a result of it, but I'm okay with that. I'm more than happy to be designed to slow growth, but real relationships, real um, kind of like um, interactions with people. Because this isn't, I'm not here for the, for the short run. I'm not here for the, long, for the long term, for the long game. I want to build a legacy here. I want to do something that is meaningful and share my knowledge. Yeah, so a 401k in the States is basically like a pension plan. So it's what we call pensions here in the UK, Jim. Um, so yeah, I mean, look, I'm telling you right now, I say this all the time. If you're working in a business, you're employed, and you're not paying into your workplace pension, funding your 401k, you are missing a massive trick. You are robbing your future self of wealth because everybody likes this idea of being a multimillionaire or being a millionaire in your lifetime. You can do that within a 401k or a pension if you start early. If you just start early and you have some discipline and you have a plan, no doubt you have a massive chance of making that happen. But we don't get taught this stuff in school and that's where it becomes a travesty. But yeah, 401ks are are a very, very good long-term investment, a pension. You need to have one here in the UK. If you don't have one, get to one. How can you claim money in your bank account after you have sold a share? So if you're using Trading212 or anyone, uh, any broker platform, you should just be able to make a withdrawal. So you just make a withdrawal to your bank account. It should be relatively easy. This is a good comment here from Jim. Let's give a little bit of context around here. Cashing out the stock market is a good idea right now if you're close to retirement. Um, yes and no. I think if you're if you're very, very nervous and you just want to sit it out, then obviously, you know, it's your choice at the end of the day. I think if you're close to retirement, hopefully what you have been doing is you have uh, an investment approach which is adapting to the fact that you're going to need access to your retirement funds in the near future. So what we would typically do in the industry is we'd do something called lifestyling. There is an argument not to do it and there is an argument to do it. And it, again, it depends on your approach and where you are in life. But lifestyling basically means that as you get closer to your retirement date, you start to taper out of equity, so stocks, shares, and you start going to more secure things. So you might decide to go into bonds maybe, or you might decide to go into something else. I don't know, gold, for example, something that isn't as volatile as equity. So yeah, you can cash out, but it means you're going to have zero participation in the markets where you might still be able to get a little bit of growth. But the more prudent approach, I guess, to take or an alternative approach that you could take is maybe just de-risk yourself in the run-up um, to your investment strategy, to your retirement day. And that will give you hopefully a little bit of coverage. You still carry risk, but it'll help you minimize it. If you have an ISA before you get married, will it be considered joint after you tie the knot? No. Um, ISAs are individual savings accounts. So regardless of whether you're married or not, it will not be a joint account. It can never be a joint account. It will always be individual. It will always be for a single person.
I am so behind on these questions, guys. <laughs> There's a lot. There's a lot here. Um, is YouTube harder than your, my wealth manager job? Um, yes. In, mm, it's harder in the sense that this is my job and I'm self-employed. Let's put it that way. Like when I was working and I was employed, if I didn't, if I didn't want to put in a full day's work, I could just I could skive off if I wanted to. I can't do that now because I'm self-employed. So YouTube is my source of, you know, full-time income. I have to make it work in some way, shape or form. So, you know, doing these lives is all about getting the engagement and getting views on the channel because I want to grow the channel because this is my my source of, of income now. So it is harder in that sense. It's harder from a sort of a mentality point of view because I have to I have to make it happen on my own. Um, I can't. I don't have a guaranteed paycheck coming in every single month. So it's harder from that point of view for sure. Um, it's definitely been a journey in terms of learning the YouTube algorithm, editing, filming. I mean, I just bought a, a filmmaker's course yesterday because I'm still not where I want to be. You know, all this kind of stuff takes investment. It takes money and stuff. So, you know, I'm trying to make youtube work as much as possible and it's you know simple things like you know saturday is going to be a five hour five hour stint for me probably more than that in prep it's probably going to be a seven hour day by the time i prepped and finished off and and doing all the stuff that i need to do because i've got speakers coming along as well i need to prep the speakers you know it's that's a full day's work and at this point in time i earned zero dollar from from that uh, live stream on Saturday. I don't have any sponsors for it. Uh, none that are paying me any money to sponsor anyway. So I'm going to put a full day's work in on Saturday in the hope that I get more eyeballs on the channel. And hopefully it then translates into revenue because they go and watch some of my other videos that might have one or two ads on it. It's very, 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 very hard and very, very time consuming. So you know, it is, it is difficult. It's difficult from a, a mindset point of view. And it's also, it's, it's harder from a just from an effort point of view, I put in a lot of hours, like <laughs> some days I don't sleep, like literally with all the stuff that I'm trying to do to keep this afloat. So it is hard. It's very, very hard. And thank you, Andy, for that super chat. Um, you're saying on here, thank you so much, Pete. Let me, let me just find you one second, one second. Let me just find you. I've got to try and remember where I am. Uh, right. So I'm five above Anna's super chat right there. Oh my God, there are so many comments. All right, I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to get through all of these guys. Um, but Andy, thank you for this. Um, thank you so much, Pete. Not being dramatic, but you but you enlightened and helped me kickstart my investment journey. Here's a small token of appreciation. Thank you, mate. I really do appreciate you. Thank you so much. And thank you for actually watching the videos. Because the only thing I can do is, you know, put the videos up. People have to watch them at the end of the day. If they don't watch them, the channel doesn't grow. So you just taking the time and the effort to actually watch them means the world. Thank you. There are so many comments. That is unreal. <laughs> that is that is absolutely unreal. Um Bobo, there's another one from you as well. Thank you so much. Um, now where are you? Here we go. We appreciate you. We'll make, you will make it as you're honest. No, thank you, mate. I, so you know what? This is the biggest thing that I, that I often get with YouTube, and I have to try and check myself a lot of the time. Um, the fact that there are lots of channels on here that are growing way quicker than mine that talk about investment and stuff like that. And like I have to constantly, consistently remind myself that, you know, I have to, I want, I always want to stay true to myself and speak from my experience and my heart and not have to adapt my approach just because others are doing better. It's very, very competitive here. There are creators that don't like each other here on YouTube because it, there's almost this sense in the UK, uh, creators, uh, fear sphere of youtube that you know we can't all coexist i i i i i'm very very confident in the in the content that i produce and the things that i put out here i think i'm very different to many people and my experience in the industry definitely sets me apart and you know i, I i'm going to rely on that for the channel to grow and i'm going to rely on that for the interaction that i managed to get with you guys and if a if one channel is growing at you know 500 subs more than me a month. That's completely fine. This is a long-term game, not a short-term win uh, kind of strategy that I'm taking on here. So appreciate it, mate. Thank you very much for that. Right. I need to find where I am. I'm not sure I'm going to get through all of these guys because um, there's a lot here. Um, I'm just reading the comment. One comment just caught my eye. Um, 
yeah, there's a, there was a conversation over there about employment opportunities from Jim. Right, let me just see if I can... I'm going to give this another 20 minutes to get to an hour and a half mark, okay? Um, and see how many of these we can actually get through. I am so, so behind. Um, where are we? Where are we? Where was I? Where's Anna's super chat? There we go. This is where I was. Hey, listen, it was a pleasure to meet you as well, mate. And uh, a lot of the other guys that were in the YouTube creators um, event, like literally I've been doing this for 18 months. I've not been able to get into a, a virtual room or even a physical room with other YouTubers. So it was nice to interact with a ton of people. It really, really was. All right, let's see where we are. Um, Okay, Kevin saying that Rocket, Rocket Companies, it's a US-based real estate company. I don't know that company, I've not tracked it, but let me just write it down. I've got Wirecard, I'm going to write down Rocket as well. The next uh, live that we do, I'll try and see if I can provide some commentary on those as well. Let's have a look at this. I'm not really sure what the, what what the, could this one's about. Um, training service is not provided by an investment entity authorized in in EU. You don't have benefit of any EU regulation protections or investment compensation schemes. Stay away from them. Which one are you referring to? I think that's really important, just to, the sentiment of that. You know, you should be very, very careful about what you invest in. Like regulation is very, very important. Like the, the video yesterday, I covered uh, Colmex Pro purely because there were a lot of people who were asking me a question about Colmex Pro. And it sounds like a pharmaceutical product or something like that. But, you know, these, this company is registered out of Cyprus. You do get some protection, but it's not the same as the protection that you get for UK domestically registered companies. So if you're going to use anyone, you have to really think about where they're regulated and what protections you do have. Because, you know, if the worst were to happen, you at least want to have some kind of protection. So, you know, regulation should not be trifled with. It shouldn't be taken for granted. It's there for a reason. It's, it's there to protect people. So really good point on that, that one from this comment, commenter here. Right. Okay. So it's not on Sunday, guys. It's on Saturday. We start at 11 o'clock. Um, we're going to start off with money tips. Then we're going to move on to crypto, on to Forex, property investing at uh, three o'clock. And then we're going to finish off at four. No, I just got that mixed up. But the sequence is going to be money tips with Andy Webb. We're going to move on to crypto. We're going to move on to Forex. We're going to talk about property. Then we're going to be talking about investing. That's going to be last um, hour of the day. So it starts at 11. It will end at around about four, half past four. Perfect. So I'm just saying that he's up to his uh, contributions and checked that, and checked if they match. They don't match, mate. That is the best thing you could possibly do. Now you could be there could be merit in you then having a look at a personal pension, possibly. Um, outside of that, if you want to continue contributing, but then you have to do a cost comparison to make sure that you're not paying over the odds. And if you are going to pay over the odds, making sure that you're actually getting benefit for paying a little bit extra. So do they have investment options that aren't available within your workplace pension? <laughs> this is a good one. <laughs> I know you guys are so vigilant through this, uh, through the comment section. It's awesome. Yeah, I try to fam f familiarize myself with international terms like 401k. There's a Roth IRAs in, the, in America as well, which are pension wrappers, but slight different legislation and rules around them. So I try to familiarize myself with international language as well. The US markets are very, very similar to ours. So, yeah. Right, just scanning these uh, the comments, guys. Bear me one second. Um, there's a good conversation going on here. 
which is good. I like to see that. Okay, this is a good one. How do you choose the best rapids for you? Um, so let's have a look at what you mean by rappers. So rappers are, pension is a wrapper. An ISA is a wrapper. Uh, an investment, general investment account is also a wrapper. If you're going to select a wrapper, the first rule is tax efficiency first. So with that being said, you need to be having a look at your ISAs first, then your pensions. They can be swapped around the opposite way, so pensions and ISAs, but tax efficiency first, so one of those two. And then you move on to things like your general investment accounts, which will be taxable for CGT, capital gains tax, and income tax. But wrappers, best selection, tax efficiency first. So ISAs, pensions, or pensions and ISAs, whichever way you want to put them around, and then general investment accounts, bonds, and all that kind of stuff. Good conversation here going about uh, uni life. Um, okay, this is a good question, not one that I can kind of like answer in a brief one. I use the number of ways that I research stocks, mate. Um, you can use some public stuff, but really, if you're going to research stocks, you need to kind of understand what uh, financial accounts uh, basically mean and, and how to read them, um, how they tell the story behind their business. Um, obviously, Google, um, reading through any white papers or reading through any updates that the companies have had, you need to understand what the company does, so on and so forth. There's a lot that goes into re researching stocks. Um, but you know, I, I, I look at the company accounts, I look at the company history, what the company does, what products they sell, whether they have any market advantage, um, who their com competition is, try to evaluate their positioning within the market, their market size, what their future projections are likely to be, all those kind of things come into, come into play. I do some of this stuff in my members group. So if you if you haven't joined the members group, that's maybe where you can help because a lot of people in the group will basically um, ask me to have a look at a particular company or a particular stock. So we'll meet on a Sunday evening uh, and we'll do like a deep dive into it and I'll show like what well, the company accounts, what it basically says, the kind of things that I'll be looking for, all those kind of things. I do that in the members group. This is a good question. What comes first, hyperinflation or market crash? I ask because in the one hand, I keep cash to buy stocks when it comes down, or in the other, I will lose money via inflation. Um, one doesn't have to come before the other, right? I mean, it isn't necessarily a sequence. There is logic behind what you're doing, keeping cash aside to, to buy when the market crashes. That does make sense. But yeah, the 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 trade-off is that you've got it in cash, so therefore inflation is going to be eaten away. Um, I think you have to be comfortable with your own strategy, right? For many people, it makes sense. Okay, I'm going to hold some cash back because if, when I see an opportunity, I'm going to buy. Investment houses do that. You have to then be happy with the fact that, you know what, for the proportion of money that I've got held aside, and hopefully it's not a large proportion of your portfolio, it might be, you've just got to square away that, okay, for the short period of time, I'm going to, I'm not going to make as much money. Inflation will erode it. But hopefully if you get in at a discount because the market has corrected, the fact that you've taken the hit with inflation won't really matter because you're going to be buying something at a lower cost. And when it skyrockets, you'll make, you'll make up for the bits that you've lost on inflation. So it's really all about being squared and, and confident in your strategy moving forward and just comfortable with the fact that, you know, you can't have your cake and eat it a lot of the time. You know, there's, there's always pros and cons. I love the conversation that's going on in the chat, guys. Really, really great. Thank you. Okay, I'm just trying to find a question on here. There's a great conversation going on in here. All right, let's just scroll down. Let's go a little bit further down.
Okay, let's have a look at this from Kelly. I have 10K in an ISA and 3K in physical silver. Should I invest my ISA cash? Love your channel. Um, well, yes and no. The question is, are you going to be comfortable with investing your ISA money that's in a cash ISA right now, knowing that maybe, just maybe, the market might might have a little bit of a tumble. It might go down in value tomorrow. If you are, then yes. Um, if you're not, then you have to ask yourself, okay, so do you want to just keep it in cash or do you just want to invest maybe part of that 10K? So you've got part of it working harder for you. Um, they always say it's time in the market. Time in the market is very, very important. Again, if you're not invested, you're not going to get the return. So you have to do what you feel is comfortable with you. Um, but you know, if you're not invested in the market, you're not getting much in your cash ISA really, to be honest. So, so if you want your money to work for you, you have to invest that money. But the question is, you need to, how much do you want to invest or how much are you going to be comfortable with investing? Just make sure you don't overextend yourself on the risk. Make sure you invest in something that gives you the right level of risk that you want to take without overextending yourself. All right, guys. I appreciate you all for being here. Uh, it's an hour 22 right now. Um, guys, I hope to see you on Saturday. Um, but thank you so much for joining in. There's been really good conversations in here. And thank you to everyone who supported on the super chat as well. I think I missed one. Did I miss one? One second. Have I missed one? I don't think I have. Have I? I don't think I have. No, I don't think I have. I haven't. But thank you guys so much. And thank you so much for the support. Enjoy your evening to this Wednesday, Wednesday evening. I hope to see you on Saturday. I have some news on Friday, some really exciting news, actually. Um, so please tune into that um, by way of the video on Friday evening at 5 p.m. But guys, thank you so much for being here and spending this time with me. Have a good evening. and Enjoy the rest of your week.